Hello everyone, my name is Dorota Jarecka and I work at Makawa Institute for Brain Research at MIT. And today's lecture will be an introduction to shell Git and package managers. So I will doing the lecture, I will present shell, discuss the version control systems, demonstrate, demonstrate how to use Git and summarize package managers. And we will start from shell and command line interfaces. And in order to do this, I want to just like spend a couple of minutes to think, how do we interact with computers? So there are two main ways of interacting, either graphical user interface or command line interface. Graphical user interface looks like this. They have multiple menus and buttons. You usually manipulate with mouse. And they're pretty popular because many people find it intuitive to use. On the other hand, command line interfaces are fully text-based. Yet some, some people still find it very intuitive to use. And if you are the person who prefers graphical user interfaces, it, you might find wondering why, do, why should you care about command line interfaces? And we just provide a couple, couple reasons why. So first of all, not every software has graphical user interface. Even if the software does, the graphical user interface might not have very limited number of features. Task done with a graphical interfaces scales very poorly. Basically for repetitive tasks, you often have to repeat huge number of clicking for every single task. The other issue is that tasks done with uh, graphical interfaces are not very reproducible. They are not good way of recording and sharing provenance. Some graphical interfaces do, they have option to record, but it's very hard, especially if you are using multiple interfaces at the same time. And lastly, if you are using remote computers or cloud computing, or you will be using in the future, they might require to use command line interface. So a few basic facts about shell. It is software that provides a command line interfaces or Unix-like operating system. It is also a scripting language, allows to write scripts to automate execution tasks. User interact with it using so-called terminal, or you might also heard about terminal emulator or term. There are many different types of shells, but during this course, we mostly focus on Bash, mostly because this is a, uh, the default shell for Mac OS and many GNU Linux distributions. I mentioned a couple of times Linux and Unix like operating system. So for those who are not sure what does it mean, I will start from defining the operating system itself. Basically, operating system is the, is the basic software that you have. It manages hardware and resources, and it provides common services for all computers, programs, and applications. There are three main operating systems used uh, nowadays in personal computers. Microsoft Windows, Mac OS X, and GNU Linux. GNU Linux has various distribution, most well known probably is Debian and Ubuntu. So both GNU Linux and Mac OS X belong to the Unix-like family. On the other hand, Windows is based mostly on graphical interfaces and does not belong to the Unix family. But you can still install additional software to emulate Unix shell. So um, if you are a Windows user, you will be still able to, to practice the, the shell. Okay, so what can we do with shell? It can execute scripts or programs that can automate your task. It can navigate your file system. It can control process and running applications. It can execute external commands like Python, SSH, that, and also can manipulate environment variables. Environment variables are variables that can be set or changed by user and can affect the way uh, programs behave. It can be half path and, and many others. So basically with shell you can do pretty much everything. 
And now will be time for like short practice. It will be mostly like short demo from my side. Um, it might be hard to follow doing the demo, but I will provide all the list of commands for you. And also you will be practicing this with TA. So we will start from working with files and directories using shell. So I will escape, I will leave the presentation mode and go to my terminal. Okay, so this is how my terminal looks like. I'm, using, I'm currently on Mac OS X and uh, by default you have the application that is called terminal. If you don't know how to find, you can always type terminal here. So just before we start manipulating our files and directories, I will just, um, I will just prove you that I'm using bash as my shell. So one way of doing this, we can check the um, viable, environmental viable called shell. And uh, in order to get the value of the variable, we can use the echo command and type shell. And you will see that indeed I'm using bash. So echo is basically is the command that prints whatever string you provide. You can, you can print hello everyone. And it will print hello everyone. So the reason why we're using dollar sign is because if you just like echo shell, it will treat shell as any other string and we simply just print shell. So this is the comment that we'll be using and we can back later. But right now, just uh, focus on the on working with directories and files. So very useful comment is often to check what is your current working directory. And for this, we can type pwd. And you will see that you will have entire path to your current working directory. Again, I'm working with Mac OS X. If you are working with Windows, you might have different forms. So uh, on Mac OS X on a Linux distribution, you are using slash to divide, to show the structure of your, of your directories. So you see that like the, the, the first one is this something what is called the root directories. And this you can, so this is the root directories. Then the next, the next level is users. Among users, users, you have Dorota. Within Dorota, you have one directory that is called TMP. And I created additional directory that is, is called ABCD. So this is how you understand the, the path that is provided. The next thing you might often want to do is checking the content of the directory you are in. And to do this, you can use the ls command. And here you will see all the files that you have within this directory. In order to list this in different way, my favorite option for ls is dash l. So this will provide you the list of files, but in different formats. So basically you have each file in new line and you have like additional information, including the day when it was modified and the size of the file. And actual LS has many uh, interesting uh, options. And if you wanna check the option, of course you can always Google, but there is also like the way to accessing the manual page by typing command ls. And you will see, you have usually like pretty extended uh, description of the, of the command and all the options you can use. So um, here I was using dash l and basically it forces output to be one entry per line. And that was the, the one that we were using. But we can also like see other options. For example, one of my favorite one is also dash t. It's sort by time of modification. 
And you can actually combine this option. So I can say ls-l-t, and you will see the order will be slightly different. I can also type shorter version and just having both options at the same time. So I can print ls-lt. I can also reverse the order by adding one another option that is R. So now I will clear the, uh, my terminal by using option clear. We'll see what happens. Well, I bet this is the nice way of clearing all the outputs. So basically, you might have noticed that I often like instead of typing, just having I just have access to the previous comment. So this is like very useful when you are dealing with bash. And the way to get this is using the, the app arrow. So basically now when I, when I use app arrow, it shows me my last comment. If I use the app arrow again, it will show me again the previous comment and so on. So I can go as long as I want. The other way of accessing the command that we used before is using Ctrl R. So if you remember that part of the command, you can use Ctrl R. And now you can type the command that you are searching for. So for example, you are not sure how to use, uh, how to use, uh, how to use man. So you can start typing M-A-N and you will see like suddenly I have the last, last time I was using man command. And you can see that like it's man and the comma. You can also like um, also type history. I'm being this. This is a like, pretty long history, and I was like doing many things recently. But you can also like first of all I will clear this. But you can also um, ask for last and comments by calling history ten. And now it will only give me the last 10 comments. So this is the very basic way of how you can, you can search in your history. And when, the, when working with Bash, it will, you will find it very useful. So this is one of the things that is very nice about working with Bash. So if you are using graphical interfaces, it's usually there's no way of finding, at least not easy way of finding what have you done like an hour ago. But what was the last comment that you did that something happened and you have no idea why? With Bash, you always have control and you always can back and you always can review the history. So this is very nice. Okay, so we were checking the, the content of the directory. Let's do it once again. So you will see that I have like multiple files. Um, I have one um, script, but besides this, I have like TXT files colors and flowers. And you can also notice that one colors has slightly different name. I, I made a typo and it's color with colors with double S. So the easiest way to modify this is using the command called uh, MV. So you are changing the name of the, of the file and it's pretty easy. You are typing colors and you are typing the new name that you wanna use. And now if you see the content, once again, you will see colors with, with double, uh, without double C. One thing that I am also like using pretty often is that you might have noticed that sometimes I start typing, but then suddenly it, it, it goes pretty quickly. This is the reason because I'm using, the reason is because I'm using tab. So when you're working with, with Bash, you don't always have to type and type comment. You often can use a uh, completion by using tab. And you see, so basically I have three different, different files with colors. That starts with colors. So if I type CO, actually if I even type C, it's if enough that Bash will know that I want to do something with the file that starts with colors. So if I press tab, it will go until it finds different version of the file. So right now I have to choose. So I have to say that, okay, I wanna actually has color B, etc. 
So this is also like very useful and it actually makes your typing much faster. Okay, so we showed you how, I showed you how to change the name, but let's say we want to separate colors and flowers and create new directories. So in order to create a new directory, there's also one command is mkkdir. And let's say my flowers. And another one will be my colors. So again, I can use up arrow and just change the last or part of the command. So right now, if you type ls-l, you will see that in addition to the files, you also have new directories. That's clear. Okay, so now I wanna copy I can move the files, but I also just want to copy all the files that has colors in the my colors directory and all the files with flowers to my flowers directory. So let's see my content again. So, okay, so there is one command that we can use is cp. So I can say cp flowers a to my flowers. And now you can change, you can check the content of my of my directory you'll see that because i was just copying not moving in my directory i still should have colors a but it will be the same in my colors my flowers a. and this you'll see that actually like when you are like working with ls and many other um, many, uh, many other commands you you don't necessarily have to work you don't have to check the the, the content of your, of your current directory, but you can also access many other directories. This time I'm just using, I'm, I wanna check the content of my flowers. So, okay, so we have the same, the same uh, file in two, in two places. That's exactly what we want. Okay, I have two more files. So one thing I can do to make it faster, I can use the app aisle. So, okay, here I have my previous command and I can just navigate and change to B. I can have the same with C. In fact, I can sometimes use add to actually move faster in my command and type flower C. So that was pretty quick, but obviously like if you have hundreds of files, it's not going to work. So I told you that with, with Bash, many things can be done quicker and can be easier to automate. So let's, look, well, let's copy all the colors files to my colors, but this time maybe use something, something new. So instead of typing the name of the specific name of the file, we'd be using something what is called wildcard. This is, this is a star in Bash. Basically, white, wildcard can um, represent one or more um, um, or more letters. So basically here, I can text, when typing like colors star txt, I'm basically saying so that something has to start with colors and has to end with txt and can have anything between. In fact, I can even remove some parts of colors to see that it doesn't have to be one character. It can be more than one character. And now I want to move to my, my colors. And when I change the content of my colors, you will see that by, by typing one command, all the files were moved to colors, were copied to colors. So this is pretty cool. So it shows you the power of Bash and how to automate, automate the tasks. Okay, so one more thing that we wanted to do was like, we can also um, create a new files that would be in like empty files. File calling touch, empty file. And when we check the content, you will see that there is new file that is indeed empty because the size is zero. Okay, that was the first part. 
that we want to cover. And now we will be working on checking the content of the files and how to ch change the content of the files. And we will be also like using simple pipes and loops. Okay, so let's clear my output. Okay, so if we go, let's go to the flowers, my flowers. So we can check the content of the directories, but let's say we wanna we wanna check the content of flowers. Of course, you can open text editor and 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 check the content, but there is also bash command that allows you to do it pretty quickly. And this is cat, G A T, flowers, A. And voila, you have like entire content of the file printed quickly on your terminal. Especially for longer files, you often don't want to print entire file, but you might want to print the first two items. So you can use the command that is called head dash n2. And you will see now only two items will be, will, will be printed. You can also call it without the dash n2. And it will uh, use a default number that I believe it's 10. So now you have like 10 items printed. That's clear. And you also have an option to print the last, the last 10 items. So instead of head, you will be using tail. And again, for tail, you also can use the dash n3, let's say. And you see like if we print the last three items. Another way to explore the content of your file, it's often pretty useful, is calling WC. So if you're not sure what is the output about, you can again explore manual page. So basically it tells you that it um, gives you displays the number of lines, words, and bytes contained in each input of the file. So, by the way, if you are using man, the way how to exit is just type in x. So, this is the number of lines, this is the number of uh, words, and this is the number of bytes. There's also a way to just simply use the name of the uh, number of the lines. And you can use dash l. So now we have the, the, the number of one for flowers A. But let's say we want to like check all the files. And we already know how to do it. We can again use the white card. So this time I have uh, numbers from uh, of line from flowers A, B, C, and at the end I also have total. So let's say we don't it's not enough that we're printing this, but we would also want to sort this. Would like to know what is the, the file with the uh, smallest number of, of lines. So there's another comment that is called sort, but you have to provide some input to the sort. So, you know, on one hand, you could somehow provide the num the, the, as an input this, this thing, but there's also like very nice way in Bash that you can automatically set something what is called pipes. So basically by, by using pipes, you are uh, passing output of the first command to the next command. So let's see what happens if I do this. You see, so this time the sort command got entire output from the WC command and it's basically sorted. So you will see that first now it will flowers B that has only 24 lines, and then it's like flowers A that has 25 and 32. So that's pretty cool. So that also like shows you how you can create like a small pipeline and pretty sometimes pretty powerful pipeline. Let's say that now you don't only wanna check this, but you also wanna you wanna save this in your um, in the file for the future. This is also like pretty easy in uh, in Bash, and again you see that I'm actually using the same comma and just like adding extra pieces. So that's 
pretty also nice in Pash that you actually like can 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 build a more uh, more extended commands starting from the simpler one. So let's say we want to have number we're using the the greater sign to pass the output to specific file. Let's see. So this time, so the output right now was not printed. We actually pass the output instead of from terminal to a file. And we can check the file. So now we are using cut number of lines to print the content of the file. And you see you, we have exactly the same. So basically what this great design does did was just passing the output to the file instead of on the screen as the default, uh, the screen is usually the default, uh, the different place you, where you will see the output. Okay, so what else can we do? So, um, also like, you know, we can, we can like, um, add, you know, modify this even more. So let's say we wanna only like have two first value of this in new file. So we can also like easily, we already know how to check first to identify of the file, it's head, dash n to number of lines. And we, we, can, we can set the output to a new file. Like two, shortest. And now we can check the content of two shortest. And you will see it's exactly what you would expect. So this is like, you know, I'm showing now like pretty simple example, but hopefully you can see how, how this can be powerful in your, in your, uh, in your work. So the last thing I want to show you was, um, okay, so one thing that I also want to share with you, let's clear the, was, uh, you remember the, the command echo. So now we can also like use the echo in to actually to add to the to the file. So let's say you wanna save some some string in a file, and you can say like happening team. And you will see that when now you check the content, you will have uh, uh, indeed the, the line hello we're pointing to. But let's say we wanna also say hello A B C D team. And now when you see the content, you will see hello A B C D team, but we have nothing else. This is because we use this is because the uh, this basically um, overrides the uh, overrides the file. If you want to keep adding lines to the file, you can also do it by using like double signs. So this time we can just add repronym. And when you see the content of the file, you, you should be able to see both lines. Okay, so now we have both lines. That's, that's pretty cool. So the one last thing I wanted to sh show you is just having the loop. So, you know, we already, um, uh, I already showed you how to use white card, but sometimes you wanna have like, you wanna have like more specific tasks and you often wanna use loops and in Bash you can, you can also do it this. So let's say, so I will, basically pretty much repeat our previous example, but this time using block. We can say do file in flowers. And when I press enter now, I'm sorry. So, um, so my, my problems, I will, I will start once again. So if I say four, five in um, flowers, 
and type enter, you will see that I will notice like I will have different prompt. So basically, I bash didn't do anything because it's waiting for the continuation. It's not it recognized all as a proper syntax, and it's just waiting what I should do. So I want to do, and I have to specify by using the 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 word the um, word do, and now we see the wc-l file. But you know, if I do like this, it will not recognize that I'm trying to use the variable that is from the uh, for loop. So in order to, for Bash to recognize that I want to access, access the, the value of this variable, I have to use the dollar sign. As we were doing this with shell when I was echoing. Okay, and now I have to just press done. And that will tell you that I'm done with this loop and uh, it should print the output. And you see, this is exactly as we were expecting. So this is also like pretty cool and you will see that in many applications that you are doing with working on files, on your data, it's like you, are, you, wanna, you wanna repeat some of the things and basically having four loops in batch might be very powerful. One last thing that I wanna say is showing that we also can run scripts. And you remember that I, I was having the, the script file from the, in the ABCD directory. Right now, I'm not in the ABC directory. I'm actually, I can check where I am. So this time, I'm not in ABCD, but in the ABCD subdirectory called my powers. So in order to move the, to the directory to this higher than I am, we can use cd dot dot. That basically tells that I should move to the prime directory. And now I can see when I type pwd, I mean did in ibcd. Let's check the content and I says head script as I. Let's check what is inside. And you will see that I have pretty much the loop that I was just showing you inside the script. One interesting thing is something that is at the very beginning. This is what is calling Shaban. So basically when you have this Shaban, it tells basically computer that it, in order to interpret this, pro, uh, the, this code, it should be run with bash. So now I can type dot slash script and be executed using bash. I could also call just directly bash. And now we have exactly the same output. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to show you, um, the short demo of how to use shell and hopefully I convince you that there are many things that you can do with, uh, with shell and um, it might be much faster and much, uh, it might be like it helps you with automation of your tasks. And now we'll be talking about version control systems. So what do they do? The main idea is that they track changes in your files. And the files can be files with code, with your images or any other data. And they also keep all the version of the file so you can access any previous version at any later point in time. And some of you can say, wait, but I'm already, already doing this. And you can show a content of your working directory that may look like this. So basically experimenting with the suffixes. This is probably the most well-known improvised version control, but probably shouldn't be called a system. Even if you keep all the versions of your file, the main problem is, would you be able to say what is the difference between retest and retest in two months or even two weeks? Are you completely sure which version of the files you are using in the last publications? And lastly, are you able to pass your knowledge about the suffixes to your colleagues? So if you are not sure, I would still suggest that you try to use version control system that they track changes and keep all the versions of the files in more, more systematic way. That will allow for easy collaboration and also will improve your efficiency. Probably it will not happen right away, but pretty quickly. So the main idea behind the version control systems is that 
creating a snapshot of entire working directory. So you can imagine if you have a directory with your project. At some point in, in during your work, you're going to want to create somehow like a copy of the directory, or even better, a snapshot that will not change in the future to, to keep it for your later for the references. And version control systems, in addition of creating the snapshot, are also creating some, some metadata that will be helpful in the future. And you can imagine that you want to repeat the same things over and over during, during the work on the project. Now we'll be talking about Git, the version control system that will be used during this course. So what is Git? It's the most popular version control system right now. It's free and open source. It is also a distributed system. So basically there's no need for the central server and it's easier for collaboration and offline work. It handles everything from small to very large projects. It is high performance, doesn't copy entire content of the files with each snapshot. And at the end, I just want to cite what Manuel Page says. It's that it's stupid content tracker. And I will remind you about this because basically that means that it doesn't think for you. It will not solve your problems automatically. It only does what it's asked to do. And the first thing to understand working with Git is the life of files in the Git repository. We will be using this, um, this figure that it is a, a bit complicated at the very beginning, but I will keep these figures during my presentation and hopefully at the end, uh, we understand it more. So one thing that I want to say at the very beginning is just that the file can have four different states in Git repository, untracked, unmodified, modified, and staged. And it you will see how the files will be moving between these states when you are creating new repository and when you are like adding new files and changing these files. So let's get started. So let's, let's start from, from your working directory with your project that already has some files. In order to create a Git repository, you have to explicitly ask Git to initialize it by calling Git init. And one important uh, comment that we'll be using a lot is Git status. It basically tells you the status of, the, of your repository. And right now, it will give you this information. The first one is that it's, you are on branch master. And we'll be talking about branch and what does it mean later. The second is that there's no commits yet. So basically, there's no history of any snapshots. Later, you have information about files that you, it, it found like three untracked files. And at the end, it's saying that there's nothing added to commit, but untracked files present. So basically, it tells you that all the files that we have in our, in our projects are untracked. So we're on the first state. And it's not a surprise because there's no, there's no surprise because we didn't ask Git to add our files to the repository. Again, you have to, you have to remember that you have to ask explicitly for every single thing when you are working with Git repository. So let's say you want to track two files. You want to track the green and the blue file. So in order to add these files to repositories, you have to call git add command. You can have other files in your, in your uh, directory and you can explicitly ask git to ignore them by creating git ignore files. For this example, we put the pink file inside so it will not be, so it will not appear in our history. And let's try to check the status again. So at this time, you will see that the first two messages are the same, but you, have, you are still on branch master, there are no commits yet, but you have changes to be committed. 
and there is a list of three files, git ignore, blue, and green. So basically what it means that that git found files that are ready to commit. And what we did by adding the files is moving the files from the untracked state to staged. But are still not committed. Git has not, uh, have not, not created any snapshot yet. Again, this is something that you have to explicitly ask Git to do. So in order to create a snapshot, you have to call git commit command in, when working with git. In this example, I'm using the, the com, git commit with additional argument dash m and provide the message in line. If you are not using dash m, git will open the, the editor so, you, so we have a chance to write the, your commit message. So again, let's, uh, let's check the status. You see that this time it's much shorter. It's telling you that you are on branch and there's nothing to commit and working freely. So what does it mean? So basically it means that we moved all files from stage to unmodified. So, and, and there are no new, new, new files to, that has any other changes. That basically is said by by writing working tricky. So the first snapshot has been created. So let's say now that you want to edit one of the files that are being tracked by Git. Let's change the green file. And let's see what, what happens when we call Git status again. So you will see that this time Git will tell you that there are no changes on stage for commit, but there is one file that is it's being it, it is modified. So by editing the file, we move the file from unmodified to modified state. Again, this is something that Git notice, but it's not assuming that you wanna commit this file, at least not yet. You can also call git the div, and then you will see the changes between your last snapshot and your current version. Next, if you think that you are ready to commit your changes, you can add, add the file by calling git add green. And this time the status will, will change. So this time the git will tell you that there are changes to be committed and there's one file green that this time has like, git is also using the green color to saying that this is like ready to be commit. So basically by adding the, the file we moved from modified to staged. And again, the, the changes are not are not committed, not yet. We have to explicitly ask and provide some meaningful message uh, to ask it to, uh, to commit the changes. And now when you change the status, you will see again that there's nothing com to commit, working tree is clean. Basically because like all files that ha has been changed are also committed. So basically we moved again to unmodified. And probably is a good time now to check the git history. So in order to check the git history, we can call git log. And you will see that uh, git gives you like multiple information. So first of all, you can notice that there are two commits. Commits basically is the moment that you are creating what we were calling before snapshots. So every single commit has multiple information. It has information about the author, the date, the commit message, and you also have the checksum value for, for the commit. The checksum value is created by, by Git, and you can read more about it in the materials that I gave you before the lesson. 
So hopefully now you understand a bit more how does it work and you understand how to move from one state to the other. There is one arrow that I didn't cover and this is the remove the file. So when you, when you have a tracked file, as we had like green file and blue file, you, you can always remove from the, from the repository. But basically by removing from the repository, you, that means that you are removing from the current working directory. It does not remove from your history. So it might be nice because you can always come back, but you have to be aware that this file is not being removed completely. And I just want to remind you again that Git doesn't think for you and it doesn't even try to guess what you are trying to do. And basically it only motivates you, sometimes forces you to think and organize your work. But every single error, it has to be initialized by, by comment that you have. Left. So now we will be talking about another important concept, working with branches. So we were discussing that uh, Git is creating snapshot over the time that you are working on project. But we haven't discussed how the history of snapshot can evolve. You can imagine that you have a linear model that basically every snapshot has one child only. It's a simple model, but often unrealistic. Basically, it assumes that you are working on one thing at a time. Another way of thinking is like to have a nonlinear model. For example, a tree model. So you are trying to look at your code history as a tree. You have multiple latest snapshots, one for each branch. And each snapshot can point to the previous snapshot, the, the parent snapshot. This basically allows you to trace the history of any given snapshot all the way back to the root. But why do we want to create new branches? So it's often the case when you're working on a new project that it takes some time before you have version that you are happy with. But once you have version that you are happy with, you might start working using this, uh, this project for your research. However, you still might want to uh, work on new features or your PI can ask you to test something. And now you have a choice. You can either work on the, uh, on the, on the branch that you are happy with and risk destroying your version or you can create a new branch. And you can take any, as long as you want working on new features. It is unfortunate, unfortunately often the case that the first approach might not work. But having Git, it allows you actually to jump back and try a new approach. And at the same time, your main branch keeps the version that you are happy with. So basically, the, the, the having new branches allows you to keep the main branch clean and allows you to experiment with new features safely on new branches. And basically also it allows you to work on multiple features at the same time. Some of the new features can take one day, one hour, but some of them might take an, a, a month or a week. And that's fine. So what does it mean to work with branches on Git? So first of all, like you, you've seen before, when we were checking Git log, that the, the, the Git log was referring to master branch. This is basically the default branch that is created when project is initialized. You can create as many branches as you want by using git branch command. You can jump between branches by using git checkout. And you can always check all of your branches that you have in your project. In this example, you will see that I have three branches, but one branch the master branch is actually has different color and has style. That basically means that this is the current branch that I'm working on. This is also the branch that the head pointer is pointing on. And what does it mean? So basically, Git has two types of pointer, branch and head. 
yeah, you can think about the branch as a movable pointer to one of the comments. It's basically nothing more. Head is a special pointer that always points to the current batch that you are working on. And you can think about that you have a snapshot that you on, on your project. And basically, when you start your new project, you have one, one, uh, one branch that is called master. So obviously, the head is pointing also to the same place as master. And when you are working on a project, the master is moving and the head is moving with, with master. And we can keep going like this. But basically, master always po it, it's pointing on one of the snapshots. And the same is with head. But now we can create a new branch. We can um, get branch feature A. And now what you see what happens is that we haven't created a new snapshot, but we did create a new pointer. So basically, you can have a situation that two pointers are pointing to the same snapshot master and feature. You can see that the head is still with master because we haven't switched the branches. If we switch the branch, the head will also uh, follow the feature A. And when we're creating new snapshots, you will see that the new snapshot will be in the feature A branch and the head will follow. We can always move back to master by, by adding git checkout master. And if we think that we want to like include all the changes that we made in the feature A branch, we can run git branch. What happens is that the master branch will have another snapshot that will include all the changes from feature A. And head will point to a master. Right now, we can actually delete the branch that is called feature A because all the changes are also included in the master. And now finally, we'll be talking about GitHub and working with remotes. I haven't mentioned GitHub before, also because I wanted to show you that you can work with Git uh, completely ignoring GitHub. But what is GitHub? So website, it's a website that provides you with public or private storage for your Git repositories. It allows for easy sharing and collaboration. It allows also first party websites to interact with your code, what might be very useful if you wanna provide automatic testing or publishing. The basic services are for free. It's also important to mention that there are similar platforms like Bitbucket or GitLab that also can be used. GitLab in addition is open source and can be installed locally. So now we'll be discussing like uh, several scenarios of working with Git and GitHub. And I will start from the simplest one that you have like single developer slash user. So as we were like discussing before, you can work with Git purely on your local repositories. However, it's often useful to have GitHub repos repository as well. And we can create so-called remotes. And uh, when creating remote, basically we're creating a new version of your project that is hosted on, on the internet or other networks. And, Git, and GitHub might be one of the, one of the places that you can create your mode. Changes can be pushed to the remote or pulled from the remote. So it can happen that once you have GitHub account and once you have a GitHub project, some other people might notice uh, your project. If GitHub repository is public, anyone can download the, the repository. So the person might not even have Git GitHub account or even Git installed on your on the local on the local machine. User can modify the code but cannot push the GitHub repository to your GitHub repository unless you unless you allow for this. So once you have actually an additional collaborator, it's, it's very often the case that people would create something what is called fork on GitHub and basically creating their own GitHub repository. Once they have their own GitHub repository, they can also connect the local repository 
uh, Python remote. And all local changes can be pushed to the remote. And in order to um, push the changes to your GitHub, the person can create something what is called pull request. Once the team is bigger, it's often the case that, that you wanna have one main repository. And it's often under a specific organization, not on your name. Everybody can create a new fork and create a pull request. Some people from the team, or all people from your team, uh, would be allowed to approve changes suggested by in the pull requests. And the last slide about Git is just to present uh, a few other tools that might be useful. So basically, like Git is a really great tool, but it, it is not designed to handle big files. As we were saying before, that every single repository uh, it contains all the files and all the history. And basically, you don't want to upload your big files to, to GitHub and to add every other computer that has the same repository. So because of this issue, it was created Git Annex. Basically, Git Annex allows, you to, allows for many, managing files with Git without checking the file content into Git. Instead, it creates a symbolic Linux. Additional tool is data that you might heard about. It relies on Git and Git Annex. It's more, it has more intuitive command line interface and Python API. And it's developed by members of the neural meeting community and tour planning team. So you will definitely hear more about data lag during this course. So the last, uh, last part of the presentation will be about package managers and distributions. So what is package manager? It's basically a collection of software tools that automates the process of, process of installing, upgrading, and configuring software. It provides data versioning, dependencies, and other metadata that helps guarantee the, the consistency of the comp computing environment. It's, it's designed to eliminate the need for manual installation and updates. On the other hand, distribution uses a package manager to index a collection of hosted packages in order, in order to centralize the delivery. So the same package manager platform can be used by multiple distributions. Many people have heard about Debian, but for people who've never heard we, we, we will be using this during this course. So I'll just mention that one, it is one of the oldest Common Linux distribution. It's the largest community-driven open source project and uh, packages can be installed using apt package manager. What is nice is that almost all the vendor packages are now guaranteed to be reproducible. And that's why we also have NeoDebian. It, it was basically established to integrate software used for research in psychology and neuroimaging into the standard Debian distribution. So this is basically the place where you, uh, where you can often find the, the neuroimaging software installed using all Debian standards. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so this is, uh, this is it for today. And uh, just so you know that the PDF version of the presentation, we also contain uh, links to the um, additional materials. Thank you.